go ahead and get started here. So I wanted to just start out by really defining metabolic health. What does it actually mean? You know, you're going to learn a lot through this and we're recording it. You can listen to it many times because I do feel like this is something that really will enable you to make, make some, some changes um, to get healthier. But, but essentially metabolic health is really what it means is how well we generate and produce energy in the body. The human body just needs to produce energy. That's like the main goal at the end of the day. And glucose, also known as sugar, is the primary precursor that really is tightly regulated in the body and needs to be very regulated in order for metabolism to work effectively. And metabolism is not just about food. You know, we're metabolizing so many different components and compounds in our body. But um, it's important to understand that glucose or sugar um, is very much Sorry, I'm just you're letting some people in here. Very much involved in that. So metabolic health can be improved by stabilizing these, stabilizing blood sugars and minimizing these fluctuations. Obviously, we're going to talk a lot. Metabolic dysfunction is the root of almost every chronic disease. So that's why I was like, you know, we need to really just get some more education out there so people can really understand what this all means. So I'm just gonna start out on a like a more sad note. And but I think it's so important for us to, you know, have a little wake up call. You know, the statistics of our health in our world are not good. And um, just to kind of go through a couple of things, over 128 million Americans have prediabetes or diabetes. Obesity rates Obesity rates have reached epidemic proportions. It started in America and now it's everywhere. There was a recent study at the University of North Carolina School of Global Public Health Research showed um, that 88% of Americans have some type of metabolic dysfunction. So I'll help you understand you know, really what that means. And it is estimated that 80% of people that, are, that currently have prediabetes don't even know it. We're not we're not looking for it, and um, again, we are going to talk about that. Ninety percent of healthcare costs are tied to chronic conditions. So these chronic conditions are more or less lifestyle lifestyle diseases. So I'm going to get into a little bit of how it got so bad, and um, most people know by now that our food industry, our food supply, is not good. And so this has resulted into not only, you know, bad food supply, we eat the food, we get sick. I mean, this is, this is the nature of what's going on right now. And um, poor diets, the majority of people have poor diets. What I will say is um, some people try to eat healthy and they think they're eating healthy, but because of the food that's available to us, it is not healthy. So that's where people get frustrated and they struggle because it's like, but I'm doing all these things, but then, you know, you really don't know really what you're eating. We have minimal protection from our government. Um, this is, you know, just a very complicated and very loaded statement. Understand that, but it's important to know that, you know, what is allowed in um, for us to consume is not allowed anywhere else in the world. We have we have a, you know, a system that really is um, very lenient as far as what they, what they pass. And there's a, a common term called generally it's grass, you know, it's gra grass approved, general, generally recognized as safe. So this is an FDA term that they kind of look at something they're like, eh, yeah, looks pretty okay. Everyone else has done kind of well with it and they let it slide through. And that's, that's essentially, you know, that's given to us as the, the consumers. So we don't have super great regulations. And sorry, I'm just gonna make sure everyone is getting in and I'm not missing any anybody. Okay, so the CDC and pharmaceutical companies, there is a relationship there. Unfortunately, there is. So there, there is a drive for profits. So when you look at money, you know, money can be the evil of 
of many different things. So there is a piece of that that drives our health care. I firmly believe, you know, that we we live in a sick care environment. We our healthcare system is designed to keep us pretty sick so that we can continue to treat. Um, it does not support preventative health. I mean, I mean, most people know this now, right? But if you take a step back and you're like, okay, wait, so my insurance will cover X, Y, Z, you know, this pill, this surgery, this, but it's not going to cover like nutrition counseling. And it's not going to cover me to look deeper into like my hormones. Like, so the, the system puts us as consumers at an advantage and every, so the, um, the solution is a pill for every ill. I mean, that's essentially the, the world that we live in now. Stress. This is super important. I, I want people to take um, kind of what I, what I talk about throughout this presentation about stress, because it literally is, um, it's, it's so much more than what, what people think of, oh, I just had a stressful situation or I had you know, a stressful job or whatever. But physical stress, so like um, internal stress versus external stress, the body does not recognize one from the other. So if you are sick, if you have metabolic dysfunction, if your blood sugars are all over the place, if you have, you know, a, um, you know, candida overgrowth, a fungus overgrowth, whatever it may be, the body is in a stress state. So when the body is in a stress state, it causes this cascade of events to happen. So body stress, now you have, you know, you can't sleep good. You don't, so if you don't sleep good, you're not regenerating. Your hormones are becoming balanced. So now it's, again, it's like this vicious cycle. So now like you feel like crap. So now you, now you don't want to do anything. You don't want to exercise. And, you know, you call your friend or you hang out with the family. And because, 80 to 90% of the population is in the same situation, you kind of think, you just begin to think it's normal. Um, so I'm, I'm here to tell you that it's not normal. And, um, you know, there's so many things, the really cool, cool part at the end that I will end with is that um, all of this is, is reversible. So today I'm talking about sugar. And some, there are people out there right now that is saying that sugar is the new tobacco. So is it? It could possibly be the new tobacco. So it's not only bad, but the bigger problem, you know, we're eating too much of it, but um, we're also now eating processed sugar. So it's cheap, it's toxic, and it's added to everything. Sugar is scientifically proven to create insulin disorders. That is, that is very clear in the literature. Sugar became industrialized in the 1990s and essentially got into the hands of all the companies to drive sales because if you add sugar, it tastes better, people eat more, people buy more. That's essentially what has happened. Sugar also now, um, and I would I'll be very interested to see, you know, what you all as consumers um, think and in, in what you have heard about this, but sugar. The processed sugar is basically created in a lab and it is designed to stimulate hunger. So it affects certain receptors, certain um, pleasure centers of the so that you eat more and you can't stop eating more. So this is the problem with the processed sugar industry is because now it's manipulating our normal physiology. And whereas we would, when we would know we're full now, nobody really has those signals, those proper signals that are happening. So this is, this is a big piece to all of it. So we all remember these commercials, that you can't eat one, but you can't eat one. No, you can't because it's designed for you to, to be addicted to it. And um, you know, when you look at the, the sugar consum consumption and how it has changed over you know, decades, you know, I know 1840 is a long, long time ago, but we look at what we were eating, less than two pounds of sugar per person per year. Now the average consumption of sugar is more than 80 pounds per person per year. And I'm gonna really open your eyes to like where the sugar is coming from because I think a lot of people right now, because when I see those levels, I'm like, I don't really eat a lot of sweets. You know, I don't really eat a lot of sugar. 
And, um, but the, the fact of the matter is sugars in everything. So it adds up very quickly. So this is just, um, you know, the sugar consumption over the years. You can see, I mean, like close to nothing and it just spiked. And then you can see here, this was in like the 2000s, it got to over a hundred pounds of sugar a year. And then um, we have seen a decline. I know this is 2016, ends in 2016. We have seen a decline and that's actually a really positive thing. It has nothing to do with um, promotion or industry. It has to do with people. It has to do with people like you becoming more educated and knowing that um, the, the amount of sugar they're consuming is not right. So people are making changes. So did you know that there's actually guidelines? Yeah, there's guidelines about sugar. Um, you know, too bad nobody's talking about it. But okay, so if you look here, the American Heart Association, this is the CDC, this is US, US um, diet, Dietary Guidelines, and this is the WHO. So these numbers here are teaspoons. So the uh, American Heart Association, this is men, so recommends nine teaspoons. This is added sugar. This is not just sugar naturally in food. So added sugar, um, they recommend that, uh, that or less um, every day. Women, six teaspoons, children, six teaspoons. So a teaspoon of sugar, you can see here, um, there's a lot of things covering up my screen, but that's what they think is acceptable to have that amount of sugar. The CDC actually says it's okay to have 12 teaspoons of added sugar every day. And this, um, you know, in line with the, a, with the American Heart Association. So again, you, like, like this is like, this bothers me. I know it shouldn't, but like you would think that they would come to a, an agreement on that so we can be consistent with the messaging. So the messaging can get to the community. And, um, but it just, you know, it, that doesn't happen. So remember this, this is, this is important for you because this will be able, you'll be able to go home and take this information and start looking at labels because one teaspoon of sugar equals four grams. And I'm gonna show you a label, but just kind of put that, keep that in, um, on the back burner right now. Because before I get into that, I just wanna reiterate that sugar is not an essential nutrient. We have many essential nutrients that is you know, so crucial for the body to function, crucial, um, sugar is not. So um, our body gets sugar from natural foods. You know, natural sugar is found in fruits, vegetables, other types of whole foods. And actually our body can also make and produce its own sugar if needed. Um, the other piece that I probably just felt like I wanted to add is that it's just no longer real sugar. You know, it's not from like the ground and the plant. It's now like in a lab through so many different processing that now has just become like this toxic chemical. And when you see it on the label, it doesn't say sugar. It says about a hundred different names. If you Google names for sugar, you're gonna see so many different ways to, to disguise that on, on a label. And these are just some common names. Sucrose, fructose, dextrose, lactose, maltose, dextrose is super common. You see that almost you see that everywhere. All right, hidden sugar in our foods. So um, I put, I wanted to just put a ton of slides on this, but I'm, I, I just want to make a point and then I'll, I'm going to briefly go through it. But there are natural sugars and then there's added sugars. So you're a, just a regular slice of, slice of bread has almost one teaspoon of added sugar. Okay, there's three grams. Remember four grams is one teaspoon. If you're eating flavored yogurt, th they put probably three teaspoons of added sugar into that. So anytime you eat flavored or yogurt, get the plain and just add like fresh fruit to that. Pasta sauce, look at this. One half cup is 10 grams of sugar. This is added sugar. So this is almost three teaspoons of sugar in your pasta sauce. I mean, the list goes on. Juice, don't ever consume juice like ever. Um, granola bars, soup have a ton of sugar. Applesauce has added sugar. Salad dressing is, is very common. Um, 
And oh my gosh. So barbecue sauce. Yeah. Most people probably know this, but four teaspoons of sugar in two tablespoons of barbecue sauce. So now you can see, so if you, you know, so if you think back of what women should have, according to the American Heart Association, it's 24 grams. Okay. That's their recommendation. So now if you had barbecue sauce, then you are almost at your limit. So putting, putting this all in perspective and, um, the box lasagna has sugar, soup has sugar, beans, forget about it, ton of sugar. So you get my point. I know, I couldn't control myself. I just was like, oh, I wanna add this one. So just reiterating some of the, some of the foods that you think are already sugary, but oh no, they're adding, they're adding a ton more. Okay, so when you're looking at a label, and okay, so let me, let me take a step back. So there's total sugars and then there's added sugars. So total sugars on a label, so you can see here. So you should see this on all labels now. You should see total sugar, added sugars. It 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 um breaks it breaks it up. So total sugars is including the added stuff. So when they pour in sugar, um, with the natural sugars. So let's say you had you know. I don't know, something with fruit that had, you know, natural sugar, but then they add more. So the natural fruit sugars will be included plus the added. So in this particular label, you know, I'm looking at this. I don't know what this is. It's probably juice, I would imagine. It's something. There's no, there's a ton of carbs. So the total sugar is 25. Added sugar is 23. So there's only two grams of real natural, and then they added basically 21 grams. So, or almost five teaspoons of just pouring in sugar. So when you are looking now at labels, because um, I know you're on here because you care. <laughs> and um, as, you, as you start to read labels, look for the added, just look for the added because it really, they should be adding zero to three. Um, so blood sugar, glucose, same thing. I know so many people have heard blood sugar, the norm, the, the word, but I want, I wanted to kind of explain it in a different way. This might help some people. Some people be like, well, duh, I need that. But sugar actually is, is required, um, for us to stay alive. Every cell in our body, including the brain, the brain cells, everything requires sugar. And so carbohydrates in our diet are the common way for us to get sugar because carbohydrates are just a more complex sugar. So like pasta bread, cereal, um, beans, crackers, all. So that's essentially sugar because it's the second you start to eat it, you eat it and you start to digest it, it immediately breaks down into sugar, just as if you would have like a candy bar or something. So when we eat it, we break it down, the sugar goes into the bloodstream. So um, it's supposed to do that, it's supposed to do that because all the cells need a little bit of sugar for energy. And then, but shortly after that, the sugar that sits in the blood needs to be removed from the blood very quickly. Because if it's not removed from the bloodstream, that's when all the issues begin. So essentially when we're doing like a continuous glucose monitor or we're doing a glucometer, we're checking for the amount of sugar in your blood at any given time. So again, I know that was, for some reason, I just wanted to kind of um, go back to that before I moved on. Now, so many, the people, people that have um, diabetes, they typically are checking their blood sugars. But the majority of people who do not have diabetes have no idea, no clue what their blood sugars are. And so um, blood sugar fluctuations or what we refer to as glycemic variability is really what is foundational to metabolic health. And so if you see this here, so you have high variability, the lines in red, and then you have low glucose variability. So the one in red 
is a person that probably has a lot of problems. So they wake up with a fasting around, around 60, shortly after that, then they spike, um, you know, they didn't even have breakfast, they have a spike. Actually, that's normal because cortisol is supposed to spike in the morning, but their breakfast spikes them a little bit and then they drop significantly. The lunch puts them way over the top, then they significantly drop. So they have this like spike, this ebbs and flows all day long. That's damage, like that's starting the inflammatory process versus somebody in the green who is relatively stable all day long. So that's essentially what we're trying, what, what the goal is in managing your, your blood sugars. So why is, so just to get into a little more detail about why the fluctuations are so bad is because independently it is associated with poor health outcomes. Numerous, numerous studies have we've looked into this, this isn't anything new. Extensive evidence links glucose variability to cardiovascular complications and oxidative stress, so cell damage, especially in people with diabetes. Variability in people with, with normal glucose is becoming very prevalent. And like before, a lot of people are walking around with this variability, but they haven't technically been diagnosed. So all of this damage is being done because they technically haven't, haven't been diagnosed. So there was just a, a study in 2018, you know, not, not a ton of people, but we do know that approximately 80% of people that have this don't know it. But this just showed that 16 out of the 20 people that they looked at, they were classified as like normal blood sugar. They thought they had normal blood sugar. There, there was no indication that they wouldn't. But when they did some testing, they, they found that they all, that 16 out of 20 had severe post-meal glucose spikes that were actually in the pre-diabetic range, so 15% of the time. So what are some of the symptoms of someone who has these constant fluctuations? If you are someone who is depressed or anxious, you have this anxious energy or you're in that stress state, um, brain fog, you can't sleep at night, you chronic pain, huge. Um, you try to work out and you just don't have the stamina, poor energy, and you, you just don't feel productive. You don't feel focused. You can't, you can't concentrate on any given task. These are, these are just some of the, the symptoms of that. Now, those are symptoms. So symptoms, again, are the body trying to give you a sign of like, hello, wake up, please, let's try to do something different so it doesn't result in the disease. And so over time, if the symptoms are kind of ignored or treated with a medication, then, then this, these are some of the diseases that can develop, um, you know, your typical diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, um, kidney disease, cancer, blindness, and Alzheimer's. All right, sugar. Um, so was it the topic? <laughs> And a lot of people wanted to know, why do I crave sugar? And um, while everyone is very different, and I always like to say this, but this is just, um, when, I, when I look at people in general and where we are with, with our state of health, um, the biggest thing is that a lot of food that we eat is now dessert. So breakfast for sure is one of the biggest uh, culprits in our issues today. It, Breakfast is not breakfast. It is literally sugar laden, full of carbohydrates. You know, it's it's just setting you up at the beginning of the day to fail because it does so much other than that that moment of eating high sugar. So, science, you know, scientifically, we know that a greater consumption of sugar at breakfast generates more more hunger throughout the day. Period. Now, if you if you want to test it. I encourage you to test it because um, you will notice a difference almost instantaneously with the caveat of saying, if your body is so used to sugar and you cut it off cold turkey, you might feel a little crappy because you will go through those withdrawals. Constant spikes causes the body to actually overshoot insulin causes the low blood sugar. So if, you're, if you eat um, high sugar meals or high sugar snacks, 
um, over time, your body keeps producing this insulin because insulin is always bringing it down. So that's the main rule of insulin. But insulin can make mistakes, especially if it's constantly being asked to work. And what, what happens is too much insulin will be produced. So too much sugar will be pulled out. And now you'll be hypoglycemic. And then the trigger for that is eat more sugar, eat more sugar. So now it becomes, again, it's just a dysfunction. Um, another thing is eating all carbs and not adding protein or fats. Um, protein and fats bring blood sugar down. So if you complement that with carbohydrates, it's, it's crazy how much your, your blood sugar can be stabilized. Consuming artificial sweeteners, artificial sweeteners increase blood sugars. I don't care what people say, Diet Coke, blah, blah, blah. We're gonna talk more about it. But um, for some people, Everyone is different, but um, different artificial sweeteners will spike blood sugars without a doubt. Um, high amount of sugar causes vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So that in itself causes um, depletions, but it also causes cravings because a lot of people will crave chocolate they're so deficient in magnesium. So that's a number, another big reason. Cortisol, um, High amounts of sugar causes stress on the body. When your body is in a stress state, it, um, it produces stress hormones. When stress hormones are elevated, the body's natural instinct is to tell the liver to dump more sugar into our blood so we can escape the stress because our bodies were designed um, in a stressful state evolutionary wise, believe it or not, is to like run from animals because really we didn't, people didn't have stress other than like trying to find food and running from animals. So we still have those same systems. So they see high cortisol. Um, and immediately that's why people, they say they gain weight when they're stressed because more sugar is being dumped into the bloodstream without them even eating it. Um, so sleep disruptions that causes more, more imbalances inhibits, you know, uh, cellular regeneration. And um, ultimately, all of this results in leaky gut, poor gut, and then now the whole, the whole cycle begins because now you develop different organisms that feed off of sugar. And so now you're craving sugar even more, and it's almost hard, hard to eat. So painting the picture, because that was a lot, um, is thinking about this. Are you a diet, not even diet soda, but diet drink, like whatever the diet um, uh, beverage is, that could be what's causing the sugar cravings. Because if you're constantly spiking your sugars all day, it's going to constantly cause you to want more. Um, are you someone that's eating bagels in the morning, sugar, yogurt with granola? Like if you are eating that, you've already bypassed your sugar amount for the day. Um, if you're having snacks throughout the day that are protein bars, crackers, chips, et cetera. Stress at work, stress, again, if you, if you allow yourself to be in that stressed state all of the time, your blood sugars are gonna be elevated. And if you, well, I won't, I won't get into that. I will touch a little bit about like um, how blood sugars are reactive to other things than just food, but um, also just eating like carbohydrate, that's it. So some, you know, this, Probably not many people do this. I used to hear it a lot more, but if you just have pasta and like bread, I mean, you know, horrible. You always, again, want to be adding like, like protein and healthy fats to every meal. And if you're not getting enough sleep, that's stress on the body, it's cortisol. And that's going to really drive that whole mechanism of blood sugar, cortisol, and then um, fat, you know, fat storage and all of that. So it will be really difficult to lose weight if that's, if that's ongoing. So if you remember at the beginning, um, I said, why are so many, or, you know, 88% of people who have pre-diabetes do not know it. So why are so many people walking around with pre-diabetes? Well, first of all, it's because um, diabetes is diagnosed way, way late in the game. You know, I don't know how many of you out there go to see your doctor every year and, you know, they check your blood sugars and you're like, maybe your fasting is like 110, maybe it's, maybe it's even 120 and they're like, you're good. Like that 126, 
So this is this is the problem because you you enter into prediabetes when your fat when your fasting um, is over is over one hundred because insulin insulin resistance has started. So the longer you wait for that number, the your disease is already progressing. So this is this reasons. Um, you want to have when you go into your doctor for fasting, you want ninety or less. And if it's more than that, you should be thinking about doing making some changes. Um, inflammation is already starting. And what I what I will recommend to to you all, if you are again getting, if you you know look at your levels or look at your get your test results and send them to us because we love nothing more than to read all of that. But um, when you go in and you get your regular blood work checked, tell them to run an insulin. Tell them to run an insulin, a fasting insulin. If it is over, you you're in, you're already entering into that that insulin resistance state. So I'll leave it at that. But um, if there's you know little pearls that you can pick up, that that will be one of them. So our diet, you know, I think again, standard American diet, also known as the sad diet. Hmm. Um, is largely processed fake food. It's filled with dyes, chemicals, additives. Nutrients are stripped and then fake ones are added back in so they can put on the label that it has vitamins and minerals. But, you know, we used to have food that was alive. It had phytochemicals. It had things that like the, the human body and the cells would take up. But now it's like literally just like dead food. And I always, I always tell people, I always say it's like dead food. I know some people don't don't really understand that, but it's almost like, yeah, they strip the life out of it and then they, you know, kind of repackage it and then they send it off to us. Um, we, we are now um, at a point where we're overfed. So the calories are not complements. The nutrients are pulled out. So people are gaining weight because they're getting more calories, but they're not getting the nutrients. So the body is always craving because it thinks it's starving. And that's, again, this part of this whole dysfunction. I um, I already said it a million times. Our food with sugar, um, but not only sugar. You know, we have the pesticides, the herbicides, and those also play a huge role in our gut health because they not only kill the organisms outside of us, they kill all of the healthy organisms inside. So when we eat it and we're not getting organic and we're not washing, we're eating that and we're destroying our gut health. Um, animal protein. Again, you know, it's just, it's sad because I, you know, we can't be perfect and this is not about being perfect, but it's about, um, you know, after, after this talk, really thinking about where can you make improvements because we can't be perfect because we're it's all around us, but you should eat animal protein. You shouldn't eat a lot, um, preferably organic, but these animals are literally living on antibiotics and hormones. They eat cheap feed. They don't eat the grass. Like you see the grass fed, you know, labels, which is great. But the majority, if you're not getting like organic or grass fed, I mean, they're probably, you know, being treated with all sorts of infections. And um, then, you know, then that's kind of shipped off to us to consume. So whatever the animal gets, you get, I mean, that's just the way it is. And, and the hormones are another whole thing. Think about this. Like um, I say it all the time, you know, women, you know, I associate more with women. So, you know, they're just, they're bigger girls now. They they go through their changes a lot quicker, and it's because of all the hormones and the dairy and the protein and the foods that we're eating. It's it's just it's it's crazy. All right, inflammation. Every disease, no matter what, always begins with an inflammatory process. So when you when you feel the signs, when you see the signs, this is when you have the opportunity to stop the progression because it. We have, we all have disease that's ready. It's flowing already. It's flowing. So the body has this unique way of saying, hello, wake up. These are my signs. If you're not going to do anything about it, I'm just going to keep on rolling into disease. So um, all disease, it doesn't matter. And so that's where um, we always are digging deeper in helping people understand like this inflammatory state. I'm going to go through this super quick. Um, but I, but I just felt like it was really important for people to understand like how this, how the inflammation in the body begins, because I guarantee, and I, and I'm not trying to say this because I also have 
inflammation in my body because of stuff that, that I'll talk a little bit about, but um, we all have this low grade inflammation and this is basically what's happening. So we eat food that's not real, right? So um, when we consume things that the body doesn't recognize as real food, um, the immune system attacks it because that's what our immune system does. When things get in that are foreign, it attacks it. So now the immune system is attacking food, right? So now we have this overactive, overactive immune system um, because we're constantly being bombarded. And again, not seeing that it's just everybody's fault because they eat like crap. It's no matter what we do, we, we breathe it, we lather it on our skin, we wash with it everywhere. So we, we are overburdened with a lot of stuff that the body and the immune system does not recognize. So now the body can't really metabolize all these toxins. And so the toxins will, um, what, what, they, what the liver cannot get rid of, it has to put it somewhere. So where it puts it is it puts it in the fat cells. And now this is where the fat, the weight loss resistance begins. Fat cells are, they become just the storage on the human body. It's no longer just like normal fat. It becomes what we call abnormal fat stores. It becomes inflammatory and the brain will never use it for energy. Because the, because the body is smart enough to say, I'm not going to use that fat because if I do and I, and I mobilize it, all those toxins are going to come in back into circulation and that's not good. So it keeps it there. And that's why when you try to lose weight, you never lose the fat you want to lose because the body is smart in that way. So now your body is in a stress state. Your immune system is weak. You're starting to develop more nutrient deficiencies. And now all of the processes that are supposed to happen with certain nutrients just begin to downregulate. And then um, ultimately they stop. So you're functioning on like, you know, some processes happening. And then over time, you know, it's just like the body is tries so hard to continuously keep up. But that's where, you know, disease, disease just begin, just really begins. So. Um, why did I decide to start uh, monitoring my blood sugars? Because I know how important it is. And, you know, I am, even though I try to be as healthy as I am, I know that there were probably some things that were not aligning with what I was doing. I also have a history of gut and autoimmune issues. Um, I, I wanted to find out how I could optimize my fat burn. This is actually important because when you have sugar that sits in your blood, you can never access your fat stores to burn to, to um, burn um, as well. So I wanted to make sure that my blood sugars were stabilized. You know, anytime you're high, you have you're fatigued. There's some days where I'm like, after I eat a meal, I'm like, why am I so tired? Like I knew that was a blood sugar thing, and um, ultimately just wanted to you know enhance my brain function and clarity because it's such a huge correlation. Just a, a touch on the difference between continuous glucose monitor and a glucometer, because I think a lot of people are very familiar with like glucometers, which are the finger pricks. You know, you test it like two, three times a day. You get a snapshot in time. Very different than a continuous glucose monitor because um, I, I just took mine off because I just, I have a new one coming, but this is on in, in your, um, like your, your below your skin. And it's measuring your glucose 24 seven. So all, everything that you do, you can see how your blood sugars are affected. So um, I kind of talked about that, but the other cool thing is you can also set alerts. So if you, you know, if you're in a really stressed state and your blood sugars spike, if you eat something really bad and your blood sugar spiked, like you can actually get alerts. So you can like curtail that um, behavior really quick, which is really cool. I. I did it for a month. I'm going to be, I mean, I'm going to do it probably you know, for a long time because I'm like really, really intrigued by it. But um, you, you really, it, it just gives you real time, like um, information where you can make changes very quick to kind of um, counteract the, the spikes. So what I learned so far and just having this, this monitor on my arm is that artificial I talked about earlier, I was a chronic gum chewer, chronic. 
I always had gum in my, my mouth. And what I found was that the sugar alcohols in that gum were sp spiking my sugars. And so I was like, God, like, what was I doing to my body all those years? It's like chewing this gum. So that was huge for me, immediately stopped chewing gum. But this is also for like drink, people that drink artificial stuff all day. There is sugar, it could be in your medications, it can be in your supplements. Um, lucky for me, I take, I carry around a bag of supplements. None of them um, spiked my, cause I take super high quality, but um, there were some supplements that lowered my blood sugar, which are supposed to. So that was pretty cool to see. Keep in mind that all foods can spike your blood sugar. It's not just about the sugar and the, the carbohydrates. Um, I do, I, I'm doing videos on this whole experience. And I talk a lot about the gut and how um, an unhealthy gut can drive certain uh, blood sugar spikes. Because if you're not, if, if your gut is not digesting well, then, you know, that food goes in and now it's a, now it's a stress on the body and you see spikes and so if you're interested in learning more, I do a whole thing on that on YouTube if you want to look at that. Um, what I've noticed that when I did have large spikes, I immediately got fatigued. Um, I talked about my chewing gum. I didn't really realize that my chewing gum was causing like this, like I would always describe it as like a rock in my gut. Like, so it was like just, it produced so much gas because of the sugar alcohols are known for just like gas producing. Um, what I was surprised about is I could eat a very large meal and if I had a combination, a balance of my protein, fiber, and fats, I would keep my blood sugars really low. So that was good to see because I always felt like you eat the, the smaller amount you eat, the better, but it didn't matter. It was like, I could have a really large meal. And if I concocted it the right way, it would keep them low. So again, just always trying to get the protein and fats and minimizing those spikes. Um, I know this probably doesn't much, but if you ever decide to start monitoring, um, you'll see the, um, you know, the spikes you want to keep like around like 20 or less um, throughout the day or, you know, after a meal. Um, just a couple of quick case studies that I wanted to go through. And this is, this is from colleagues. This is not my patient. This is um, because we haven't started the continuous glucose monitoring, but um, we, we definitely are going to be, I'm still working out all the details for that. But I felt like I wanted to add these because it gives you kind of like a real perspective on how knowing um, your blood sugars and how that can help. So this is a particular, per, uh, this was a female and they talked about her history. history. She grew up in an agriculture town, you know, farms around. She ate a horrible diet. So sad diet, high processed food. She had a lot of stress, you know, kind of going into college. In college, she lost a friend, um, just kind of went into this, this downhill spiral. Gained 35 pounds. She graduated from college and she was di di diagnosed with prediabetes, dyslipidemia, and was put on metformin and a low fat diet um, from her doctor. So, prediabetes, dyslipidemia. So, she, you know, high cholesterol, high, high triglycerides, that type of thing. So she put on metformin, um, followed a low-fat diet. Um, then she started to develop chronic pain and fatigue, and she couldn't, she was sleeping 12 hours a night. She was just like, you know, couldn't really function. And by 35 years of age, she had full-blown metabolic syndrome and then went into diabetes. So this is also while, you know, obviously going on, you know, this, this diet and on metformin. Gosh, I just feel like I have to go over that again because that was so crucial. I'm going to quickly go over it. Um, so what happens in her body when um, she would, when, she, you know, during this whole metabolic syndrome diabetes is that, um, you know, the sugar that's in your blood can no longer get into the cells. So when, um, when sugar can't get into the cells, it gets deposited into the fat because that's where the body would just push it to you know, because it couldn't go where it was supposed to go. So her body kept producing all of this um, sugar. And um, then, you know, obviously then it was going into the fat stores. And then what ended up happening with this particular person, because so much sugar was sitting in the blood, she started to produce her own fat from that sugar. And the body actually does have an ability to do that because when the body does not like excess sugar, it does not. So 
um, it started, to, she started to produce her own inflammatory fat and it would get pushed into all those different fat stores in her body. And it just became this horrible, you know, vicious cycle. So all in the meantime, she was eating a low fat diet. So she's like, why am I gaining fat when I'm eating low fat? Um, she felt she had no energy because the, the nutrition wasn't getting into her cells. It was just kind of sitting there. And so she was, she was starving all the time, but, you know, didn't understand why all this was happening. So that's, that's again, just the core of metabolic dysfunction. So when things don't make sense for you, when, um, you know, you're like, I can't lose weight. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. It could be because there's metabolic dysfunction. So what the treatment was for her was they immediately looked at her blood sugars and they fixed up her diet, identified the foods that was putting her all over the place and um, increased her fat, increased her fiber intake, worked on her liver because her liver was super congested and um, blood sugars and A1C normalized, normalized within three months. She lost 20 pounds with not really trying to lose weight. It was just like fixing her body and um, all her pain had subsided and her, her energy skyrocketed. Um, one more study that I thought was worth, again, just kind of mentioning, was a 40-year-old female, neurological decline, slurred speech, balance issues, fatigue. This patient was super um, health conscious. And um, she ate whole foods. She, she was, lived on a farm. She was a meditation teacher. She exercised daily. And um, what they found with this particular person was that the healthy foods that she was eating, like the broccoli, sour, sauerkraut, and matcha tea was spiking her sugars. And she was eating this all day. So all day she was kind of undergoing this, um, those ebbs and flows of blood sugars as well. Inflammation um, can get so bad that now inflammation has crossed the blood barrier and starts to affect the brain. And so that's why her balance and things like that started, um, her slurred speech started to um, become affected. And all of that was started to, started to improve significantly when they started to control her blood sugars. All right, body crying out for help. Again, some signs again. If you crave sugar really, really bad, you know, especially after a meal, um, you eat the sugar and you're still not relieved, you know, that is a really good sign something's going on. You're tired, want to go to sleep immediately after you eat, can't lose weight, you have brain fog, visual problems. These are, these are signs your body is um, metabolically dys dysfunctional. And then you could take it a step further and get some testing. This is metabolic dysfunction, dyslipidemia. So you have low HDL or high, high LDL, you have high triglycerides, or you just have high blood sugars um, or high A1C. You, most people aren't getting their inflammatory markers tested, but if you have and you have elevated inflammatory markers, that's metabolic dysfunction or your liver enzymes, you know, um, most people do get liver, their liver markers checked. If those are elevated, that's a good sign there's something going on. And then of course, blood pressure. All right, super quick. <laughs> I'm saying that. Type one, we've all heard of. Type two, we've all heard of. There actually is four different type um, types of diabetes. And you'll be hearing about type three more because that's an, it's the unfortunate nature of the world we live in. Type one is uh, typically autoimmune disease. So usually that's diagnosed younger. Uh, the immune system attacks the pancreas. The pancreas is what uh, secretes the insulin that, that takes our blood, our sugar out of the blood. So now, now that no longer happens. So now type one diabetics have to inject insulin so they can remove the, blood, the sugar. Type two is lifestyle. You know, it's a lifestyle disease um, because insulin now has become um, resistant or the cells are resistant to insulin. So now your the sugar in your blood just begins to elevate and um, no longer really uses your sugar or carbohydrates for fuel unless you now do something to get it to work in a way that it was meant to work. So that's obviously doing insulin or metformin and things like that. Um, type two diabetes, uh, I 
I firmly believe it is it's autoimmune as well because you can't get to a state of metabolic dysfunction without immunocompromise, um, you know, um, the immune system being largely affected because the immune system, you know, sits in your gut and everything is all related. So um, type 1.5, I've had two patients with type 1.5. So they were diagnosed at type one um, earlier in their life, not super early, but maybe, you know, 15 and then developed type two just from four or, you know, lifestyle eating habits. So now they have type 1.5 and then there's type three. And so type three is the inflammation and it's not necessarily like it's so severe that now it passes the blood brain barrier and goes into, um, you know, the, the brain and causes a lot of damage. Um, it literally could, could be that, you know, there's just certain pathways that are happening when, when there is inflammation in the body. And um, so this type three is now these inflammatory molecules are damaging the neurons that's causing Alzheimer's disease. So one of the things that I think is important to know is that you don't have to be diabetic to get type three. You can actually get type three diabetes um, just from the dysregulation of blood sugars. So again, this is this is all about like being proactive about your health and and if you are, you know, in in like you're that waiting stage of like getting diagnosed, like you know, you can do so much right now. Again, what does excess sugar do? Uh, dysregulation of temperature in the body, it imbalanced hormones, affects your reproductive health, um, causes vitamin deficiencies, neurological dysfunction, impaired metabolism, and obviously dysregulation of blood sugars. So, um, getting towards the end here. Uh, so, okay. So let's say like you hear all this information and you, now you want to go, you want to go talk to somebody in your life. Listen, I have this going on, this going on. I need to, I need to get my body in a healthy state. So if you're, if you're lucky and you go to somebody that kind of knows what they're talking about, they'll tell you this. All right. I need, we need to clean up your diet. You need to eat cleaner. You need to get more healthy fats. You got to stay away from the pro-inflammatory fats. You need to add more protein to your meals because protein bring, will stabilize the blood sugars. You know, drink water, get off the flavored and God forbid, you know, uh, actual soda, soda drinks. You, you have to get more sleep and you have to reduce your stress. Sounds super good. But problem is, is that none of that works when you have metabolic dysfunction. So I talk about this all the time and I'm like, we can clean up diets all day long. And we can tell you to eat less and go on restricted calorie diets and healthy food, but it's, it is going to take years and years and years of, of compliance and diligence in order to see anything. Why? When I started this business and I started creating my, my, my own weight loss programs, I'm like, we need to get the body in a healthy state super fast. So, um, so not only weight comes off, but now everything else starts to function better. And so that's essentially what we did. And um, so I'm going to talk about, you know, I'm going to end obviously with talking about our metabolic reset program, but this is, this is essentially what our program does. It targets that inflammatory fat that again, your body isn't even, doesn't recognize it because it's bad. It has toxins, it's inflammation. So it targets that and um, mobilizes it. The meal plan is going to help stabilize blood sugars and it's going to enhance the insulin sensitivity. Our meal plan excludes all inflammatory foods. You're going to see significant um, infl inflammation in the body go down. Uh, hunger and cravings essentially go away after the first week. The body now is healing and signals, proper signals are finally 